consultant interventional cardiologist in Riyadh. She will be presenting the heart disease problems in COVID patients. That will be followed by Dr. Mirbat al Asnaj, who's my colleague and interventional cardiologist in Jeddah. She will be talking about managing STEMI patients along with protection and setting up your cath lab. And followed by Dr. Hamid al Ghamdi from the Eastern Province, Mam, who will be present Al Khubar, sorry, who will be presenting the management of non-ST elevation MI uh, during uh, this uh, COVID pandemic. I will be assisted by two wonderful panelists, Dr. Khalid Al Faraidi from Eastern Province as well, who is the past president of the Saudi Arabian Cardiovascular Interventional Society, and uh, Dr. Uh, Nabil Ismail from Jeddah who is currently a board member of the Saudi Arabian Cardiovascular Interventional Society. So all of you, thank you for coming and welcome to all our participants. Now we are now almost 300 participants. So without uh, uh, wasting time, it's exactly eight o'clock. We will ask uh, Dr. Rasha Bawardi uh, to start with her first presentation, uh, cardiovascular disease complications in COVID-19 patients. So Rasha, you can... Uh, thank you, Dr. Waqar, and to the uh, panelists, to the Saudi Heart Organization for, uh, Association for organizing this webinar. Um, so unfortunately, as we all have seen it with the rise of COVID-19 cases uh, around the world, we've been seeing more cardiovascular complications along with it. So I hope this webinar focuses on the cardiovascular part of it. Uh, the objectives of my uh, presentation will be to touch briefly upon the, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in COVID-19 patients, and then more in details about the cardiac complications that we've been seeing so far. So the first question that we as cardiologists are, are going to be concerned about is, are, uh, are the cardiac, cardiac patients more susceptible to having the virus? Uh, there have been a few small studies followed by meta-analysis from China that looked about, at 1527 patients, of which they found that hypertension was uh, prevalent in 17.1%, cardiocerebrovascular disease was prevalent in 16.4%, and diabetes was prevalent in 9.7%. So these numbers, when they compare them to the general population, they found that the hypertension and diabetes uh, was uh, prevalent in the same um, in the COVID-19 population, the same as the general population, but the cardiovascular diseases might have been higher in the COVID-19 patients. However, um, more studies have um, come up afterwards, and one is from the CDC Weekly, um, from China CDC Weekly, and that looked at a larger patient's uh, population, which is about 44,072 confirmed cases. And in those, they found that the prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease was actually pretty similar to the rest of the general population. This was mirrored by another study from the US that also looked at a larger number of 74,000 patients. And they also found that the cardiovascular disease, although the hypertension wasn't actually reported, along with the diabetes was in the same in the, um, in the two population, a general population and the COVID-19. So bottom line is that our uh, cardiac, cardiac patients are um, at the same risk as the general population uh, to having the, um, uh, the same um, prevalence of having, yeah. the same risk of having it. Uh, Dr. Arash, uh, yes. your slides are not moving yet. Um, You're still on the first slide. Okay. One second. Can you still see see it moving or no? Uh, we'll just see the slide. Let me yeah, uh, stop sharing it here again, just one more time. Okay. Can you see it moving? Um, no, not yet. Uh, one second. Uh, we can just one second, give me one second to stop sharing. It. Yeah, stop sharing. Then is it moving? No, we don't see your screen right now. Um, just 
So you do the same steps, open PowerPoint in the background, and then it is, share yeah. screen. I'm doing it exactly. One more, sorry about that. Okay, just we just did it. What? Uh, Bilal, I'm can moving you the slides, Steve. No, we don't see your. Uh, it says screen sharing, but we don't see it. Maybe do it without slide view, just a regular PowerPoint. Uh, okay, if you can just close the, your PowerPoint and reopen it again. Mm hmm. Well, if she can email it to you and you open it from your uh, laptop. I can do that. Can you see it now or no? No, no, it's a black screen. And I think we are getting many questions from the participant. They don't see it also. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to just stop it here. Um, yeah. Can someone share their screen just to see if it's working or if it's a technical with the whole system? Yeah. Uh, Amirvat, would you like to scare, uh, share your screen, please? And then so we can just do that. Somebody's recommending that you turn off your um, your camera, Rasha, and try again. The camera. Yeah. Do you see it now? Yeah. Stop your camera and then uh, share your slide. Um, can you see the slides? No. No. Uh, weird because it just worked right before. Um, yeah, it did. So, do we want to um, move maybe to another talk? Yes, or? I think we will go to the next talk. I will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Amirva Talasnat, interventional consultant and in interventional cardiologist and director of the CAT lab in Jeddah at the King Fahd Armed Forces Hospital, who will be talking about management of STEMI in these very difficult patients and uh, protection in the CAT lab setup. Dr. Amirva. Sure, I'm just pulling up my uh, presentation in a second, sorry. Um, right. Can you uh, somehow um, share my slides, please? Okay. Close. Um, I'm for whatever reason I'm unable to share. It um, disappeared on me again. Is the host able to share my my desktop? No, I can change role and forbid, remove, rename, put on hold. No. Um, Mail it to Waqar and you share it, Waqar, since you're the master, maybe? Yeah. I'm not sure, but we can try. Can you share your screen then? Let's see, let's see. Can you see this now? Yeah, we do. Okay. Now it's there. Yes, perfect. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Okay, so assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I also want to thank, thank Saudi Heart Association, Dr. Fawaz Bukhari and Dr. Waqar Ahmed for the uh, invitation. I was tasked to discuss the management of ST elevation myocardial infarction during the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, you know, before indulging into ST elevation MIs during any outbreak, the goals of any health establishment are really two part. First, you want to limit the transmission of the infection to the public and, of course, the healthcare personnel. And number two, you want to deliver appropriate and timely care to patients with ST elevation myocardial infarctions. So how can we do that? Well, we do that by adhering to isolation protocols, provision of personal protective equipment, rapid bed turnover to accommodate new cases, and at the same time to protect established cases from acquiring the infection during their current hospitalization. Now, in line with the beds, we also want to reserve intensive care beds for those who require ventilation, ECMO, or other forms of circulatory support. 
Now, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is accustomed to things to use uh, or, or that follow um, bed efficiency and utilization very well on an annual basis uh, during the Hajj or pilgrimage. The uh, case right now is very different than during the pilgrimage season, primarily because we're talking about an infectious outbreak that is highly contagious. The, historically, the only thing, the only precedence that we have is actually the MERS-CoV, which was uh, in 2014. So the protocols at the time, and this is where we can extract a little bit of information and kind of tailor our current protocols to them, is what happened during the MERS-CoV 2014 outbreak, the confirmed cases of MERS-CoV were transferred to the Ministry of Health. And those facilities were equipped with isolation standards, ICU beds, ventilators, ECMO, and the personnel with the, who are qualified and with the uh, appropriate expertise. The remaining tertiary centers with 24-hour cath labs remained sterile and able to treat the acute coronary syndromes in accordance with the guidelines. So for example, you had a patient who was MERS-CoV positive or suspected. If they did have an ST elevation MI, we did proceed with a primary PCI using environmental precautions and, and protective equipment. The patient underwent a left ventricular, ventriculogram. No formal echocardiogram was done until a MERS-CoV test was actually done and confirmed to be negative, and the patient remained in isolation for that. The same applied for high-risk non-ST elevation MIs that required early intervention. The only difference was really in the low-risk non-STEMIs and the unstable anginas, where it was mandatory to do a MERS-CoV test, and if it was negative, we continued with the uh, standard of care uh, guidelines. If they were positive, uh, they were only offered conservative care. Now, there are obvious differences between the MERS-CoV, and many of us would remember it, is that MERS-CoV patients were highly symptomatic and so very easily identifiable. The infectivity rate of uh, MERS-CoV was also lower, and so it allowed the health systems time to react appropriately. That's not necessarily the case uh, currently with the COVID-19 cases that are um, not as easily identifiable. The majority are, uh, very, are asymptomatic. It is at the end of the day a pandemic where quickly uh, healthcare services can become overwhelmed and the services are saturated and are functioning above capacity. But the other uh, difference that we noted is that the deter deterioration in hemodynamic status and the fulminant myocarditis that has been reported in COVID-19 uh, COVID cases around the world, uh, we didn't really see a lot of that during the MERS-CoV. The, prim the primary role of ECMO during MERS-CoV was for oxygenation, not really hemodynamic support. And we have some published uh, observational data on that. The other most important difference between them is that COVID-19 infectivity rate is higher amongst the healthcare workers. And that is really what uh, is, is forcing the systems across the globe to construct newer pathways. So the American College of Cardiology and the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions, they published a statement, and central to that statement was PPE, provision of PPE, and preparing a laboratory that is dedicated um, for uh, COVID-19 cases. Now, the Wuhan pathway from China uh, uh, brought to the surface once again thrombolysis. Imperial College published the statement from the Saudi Arabian Cardiac Interventional Society is now available to us. And certainly in our center, we have tailored and tried to extract as much ex experience from all the centers. So if I quickly look at the Wuhan experience and what they actually looked at is they wanted to start with initially uh, making sure these patients were they co co likely to be COVID-19 positive or not, whether it's clinically or by even doing a CT chest. If COVID-19 was excluded and the patients presented with an ST elevation MI in less than 12 hours, they were actually uh, offered thrombolytic therapy in the coronary care unit. If it exceeded 12 hours, then they would consider performing PCI in an isolated cath lab. However, if the patients were STEMIs that were uh, either suspected or confirmed COVID-19, and they did not have a pneumonia and presented in less than 12 hours, they were still given lytic therapy. If it had exceeded 12 hours, uh, they were given, uh, they considered benefit and risk of primary PCI in these patients. However, if they did exhibit any form of pneumonia or instability, these patients in fact had conservative treatment uh, looking towards a, a strategy of rescue PCI at a later time when the patient actually recovers. And this is the pathway that resurrected lytic therapy in uh, modern era. If we look at the NHS and use Imperial College uh, in their pathway that uh, is now made available to us, they really looked at it slightly differently, and they have been advocating guideline-directed therapy, which is really primary PCI. They looked at the COVID probability. 
So if patients had either a low risk, uh, low probability of COVID-19, they still had primary PCI in one of their cath labs with the basic protective equipment. If it was moderate uh, or confirmed or high probability, they still recommended primary PCI, however, in a dedicated COVID lab with full protective uh, uh, equipment for the staff. Now, if it's confirmed or high, they, gave, they have a window uh, for considering fibrinolytic therapy. If you look at my slide over here and you actually look at the NHS and what they consider full protective and basic uh, protective, I'm not going to go into detail because our colleague Hamid El Ghandi is going to discuss it in his presentation and I don't want redundancy. But if you just look at the basic, many centers around the world would consider the basic actually their own full protective equipment. And that has to be taken into consideration at any point in time uh, when any center decides to uh, form its own pathway. If we look at the Saudi Arabian Cardiac Interventional Society statement, which we're all uh, extremely grateful for, they actually looked at it from a very different angle. And what they did is they looked at the STEMIs and stratified them. So whether you use the GRACE score or you use the, STEMI, uh, the TINI score, if the patient was low risk STEMI, and these patients suspected or even confirmed, they recommended fibrinolytic therapy. If they're high risk STEMI and they are confirmed COVID-19 with a pneumonia, they recommended fibrinolysis. If the patient is stable with no pneumonia, they still recommended fibrinolysis. But if the patient is a suspected COVID, so not confirmed yet, now they look at the risk score or the uh, triaging score for COVID-19. If it is um, a high score, then they recommend fibrinolytic. If the patient is low, you consider co uh, uh, primary PCI with the necessary precaution. Now, the only thing I'm going to say is we've just gone through a spectrum of uh, protocols and proposals, but at the end of the day, it is important to individualize the decision. And you look at each individual center, you look at the preparations that have been done in the center and the contingency plans. But it's not just about the contingency plans and the preparations. We need to look at the available expertise in that center and the kind of services that are provided by that center. And they all need to work harmoniously and uh, um, together. So for example, you cannot apply the same protocol for a center that has 24-hour cath lab capabilities as opposed to a center that works only during the daytime, uh, has a cath lab functioning during the daytime. Likewise, when you have a center that provides advanced care, for example, renal transplant or advanced oncology care with, for example, bone marrow transplant, these are patients whose care needs to not be interrupted, needs to be continued, and it cannot be the focus of the administration and the hospitals cannot be restricted to acute coronary syndromes. And so it really has to be harmoniously and all of this needs to be taken into account. Finally, the current patient load. So if you do not have a large COVID-19 patient load, it may be wise to continue with the guidelines. And the other thing is the current availability of staff. So if a large number of your staff have been sent in home isolation because they have been in contact or are positive, whether they are, uh, whether these patients are in fact um, um, symptomatic or not, what makes sense is to um, adjust your pathways. And so just very quickly looking at what we have done at King Fahd Armed Forces Hospital uh, uh, in our center, is if the patient is zero risk, we would still like to adhere to the guidelines and provide primary care. However, if these patients are, uh, their risk is actually high, more than six, we want to give lytic therapy, but that is because we have on-site COVID-19 testing and the results come within three to five hours. So in keeping with the 120 minutes uh, that the European guidelines and the uh, uh, prior uh, by Dr. Dwayne Pinto, the publication um, that suggests that 120 minutes, if you, 120 minutes for these patients, then you can go ahead and give lytic therapy. And if they're negative, we proceed with salvage PCI. If they're positive, you look at the patient, but ultimately they go into the medical ICU. And in our center, what was important was to introduce the futility of care. It is important to discuss with the intensivist, at what point is it going to be DNR with the patient, with the family, and with the rest of the team. And it's primarily what the next slide is about. Um, so if we look at the next slide, ultimately most of the centers are going to um, want a dedicated lab. So with the dedicated lab, minimal items in the lab, you want a negative pressure lab with HIPAA filters and UV ray uh, uh, installations, but you want minimal items in the lab itself. So all consoles should be removed and you have a bare lab. In our lab, we've removed the um, uh, uh, impella consoles, the um, IVUS console, and OCTs, et cetera. And we bring them in as need be. The supplies are in a container in the control room and we bring the wires and balloons and stents as we need for in a sealed container. 
The lead aprons remain in the lab and they do not, do not come out of that lab. The clogs, the boots, the shoes, etc. likewise. There are carefully uh, uh, marked bins for discarding items and terminal cleaning, and there are some, area, some labs that uh, recommend an anti -room. So after the lab, you want to talk about the skilled staff, and I kind of alluded to it. So we're trying to keep it minimalistic. In the lab, we have an operator, a scrub nurse, and a radiographer. In the control room, we have a CV technologist and a circulating nurse who remain there and come into the lab only if we need them, and of course, with precaution. But also the parallel teams. So we do not want teams interacting with each other. So if we are doing a COVID patient, we don't want that same team lingering and interacting with the remaining of the teams. And we've applied that outside of the cath lab as well. So when we have consultations, we actually have a, consult, a COVID consult team and we have a general consult team and they do not see the same patients and they're not around in the same places. So moving on to the patient himself or herself, the mask remains on the patient, the stretcher that we bring the patient in remains in the lab. This is contrary to what our normal practice is. We try to keep as much space available in case we need to run a code. But in this case, we've chosen to keep the stretcher in the lab. Transportation, we have a marked elevator with, uh, for COVID-19 patients only. And we use minimal staff to, uh, to accompany the patient. Of course, more staff are required as the patient is sicker, requiring a ventilator or mechanical support. All of this, we have to keep in mind the time and the supply of the protective equipment and the doffing and donning it, uh, uh, of, this, of the equipment and how comfortable our staff is with it. And this takes us to the point that I kind of mentioned a little while ago, which is the codes and DNRs. Conventionally, peri-procedure DNR orders are suspended. But are you going to suspend a DNR order when you take the patient to the cath lab? Do you need to be taking the patient to the cath lab who, uh, who is a DNR? I don't know. But we do know that STEMI patients are high risk for cardiac arrest, for respiratory arrest, and uh, they can spiral very quickly. And that needs to be taken into consideration when opening a cath lab and making the decision to take such patient to the cath lab because it not only entails mechanical circulatory support, which requires skilled staff, and if they're home isolated, that staff is not suitable, but perhaps anticipating preemptively intubating these patients and keeping your anesthetist in the loop. That may be the wisest decision, but again, uh, uh, keep in mind what futility means, keep in mind what PPE means. And finally, this is my... Uh, really the last slide that the what seems to make sense is to have assigned centers that are pandemic receiving sites that are fully equipped and others that are capable of managing non-communicable diseases and to continue the care of patients that uh, are at high risk adhering to the guidelines for as long as the system is able to do so where it's not overwhelmed ppes are still readily available and the staff is readily available but the final point, I think, is the most important point, which is having flexible pathways. Uh, I know that we have changed our pathways for consults, for the cath lab, et cetera, several times. And that is important as the case number increases, as the number of employees are infected. So we have to be prepared for uh, this kind of flexibility in the pathways in pandemics such as COVID-19. And uh, I think I'll stop here, Dr. Waqar. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Amirva. That was a very comprehensive uh, review of excellent uh, topic and protecting ourselves and flexibility. Uh, Dr. Nabil, do we have any questions from our audience that we can direct for Dr. Amirva for five minutes? Yes, uh, we do. Uh, there is a question here directed to Dr. Amirva. So what could be the changes in the regular protocol of primary PCI in order to avoid or decrease the need for an emergency-based intubation in the cath lab for COVID-19 patients. So patients who are COVID-19 or highly suspected and uh, emergency-based intubation, being on aerosol pr uh, producing intervention in, in non-negative pressure. Absolutely. So I think it is important to put all of these into consideration. Um, at the end of the day, what you do want is you want to talk to your anesthetist. You want to make sure he has his equipment. He needs to, he or she need to get their, their uh, protective gear on. He or she need to make sure they have their assistance and everything. And having an elective intubation is far, uh, um, probably safer and wiser than and, and, um, you know, an emergency intubation. And so I think it's perhaps wise to lower the threshold. Uh, but then again, um, it also begs the question that, should all of these patients be coming to the cath lab? 
um, um, I think I have moved towards the, the a more inclined to consider the safety of the staff uh, and to discuss it before taking the patient to the cath lab. And, and we actually discuss a lot of these cases with our surgeons and with our anesthetists. Um, we've done a few left mains and so on, which normally we would have sent to the OR, but it's nice to have an upfront discussion and it's a multidisciplinary team discussion and the, the doors of communication have to be open. Um, I think that's the biggest change that has happened is that suddenly we're all available um, and suddenly every case is being discussed by uh, multiple multitudes of people. That's what makes the difference, to be honest. Another question here, do we need negative pressure or just the HEPA filter? No, I believe you do need negative pressure. And if you look at the ACC guidelines, the statement with the uh, um, SCAI, they made it very clear. You cannot tell when a COVID STEMI patient is going to vomit and that's aerosolizing. You don't know when they will arrest and you will require cardiac massage. That, that isn't an infrequent incident in patients with STEMI. They may have VT, you may need to shock them, et cetera. Uh, so I, I would say negative pressure is um, mandatory uh, when you make these kind of decisions. Dr. Dr. Khaled? Yeah, Dr. Omerba, there's a question from UK. They, tell, they say here they're treating all the STEMI as COVID suspected uh, cases. Uh, because do you think this is could be working this protocol even because of the asymptomatic of the nature of the disease yes I think with time that is exactly what we're learning that it's 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 really difficult to tell um, who is COVID positive and who isn't and we're moving more and more to believe that assume everybody is a suspect you know at first when for example in our emergency room in Jeddah uh, we used to say, okay, if the patient is traveling from Mecca or coming from the Eastern province or whatever, and this is what the scoring system is. With time, our infection control team actually changed that. And Jeddah now is one of the sites. So I no longer ask my patient, were you, is there any risk, uh, any recent travel? And so I think it is safe to presume at this point in time that everybody is. And so uh, the decision to take to the cath lab and expose more people um, is central to our decision. And that's why we recommend lytic therapy in our hospital, giving, doing the COVID test, which takes about three to five hours, and then uh, streamlining where, which direction the patient goes. Another question, uh, Dr. Merbet came as, uh, do you think that uh, the number of STEMI cases is going down in the COVID era? What do you think about this? Uh, it is. It, ha it has come down. Um, I think we were looking at our numbers last week. Uh, Dr. Shady was on call from our center, and he has done uh, five uh, STEMIs only um, during the course of the entire week. So we have seen it. We saw the same thing during the MERS-CoV, and we see the same thing every year during the pilgrimage or during Hajj. Um, it's hard to tell why. Perhaps um, patients are afraid to come to the hospitals and present. Um, perhaps uh, the, the lockdowns are making them apprehensive and they're not coming. But what we do see and what we did do see every year after Hajj being in Jeddah, which is in very close proximity to Mecca after the pilgrimage, is that immediately after the Hajj period, we see a lot more patients and they're a lot sicker. Uh, another question, and uh, I think it's a very good question about uh, the correlation between COVID and myocarditis, which is uh, resembling uh, STEMI. And, we see many cases report of normal coronary. Some suggestion do you think an echo uh, has a role before doing the angiogram? A couple of questions regarding that and the theme that. Yeah, so we, if a patient has um, um, COVID-19 or is highly suspicious, we actually, um, I, I would personally avoid an, a formal echo. I think a limited focus or, or just a handheld echo helps streamline these patients. Patients who are not ST elevation MIs, again, this is our own hospital's protocol. What we do is we have been doing CT angiograms for these non-STs and, and, and middle patients. But I think one thing we have clearly learned from these cases of myocarditis that keep popping up with the COVID-19 uh, worldwide is rushing to the cath lab may, be not, may not be the only the wise thing and may not be the only thing that these, we can offer these patients. So our primary targets are really two. 
One is controlling the inflammatory process, which is hyperimmune response, and dampening it with whatever guns we have, uh, immune modulators. And the other thing is addressing the viral load that these patients have. And till, to date, I know we do not have anything that has um, been tested in a randomized trial or even observational that has been proven. But ultimately, I don't think rushing to the cath lab, putting in circulatory support devices and so on in fulminant myocarditis works alone, especially if it's late and not placed early, and especially if it's done alone without uh, um, other, parameter, other, other um, um, interventions such as immune modulation. Uh, another question about uh, access, Dr. Mervet, in uh, STEMI or COM would you change the access, radial, femoral, any? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I have given lots of talks about radial versus femoral. Radial is far safer. Um, you do not want a patient who is COVID-19 with any kind of platelet issues and so on, bleeding, and the risk of bleeding from femoral axis is clearly higher. Um, you're not any closer to the patient, by the way, by, when doing radial. And I know that's the concern, and that's where that question stems from. What you can do is, if you choose to do radial to reduce the bleeding risk and so on, is use extension tubings. I mean, at the end of the day, move further away from the patient. Your lead shield is working for you, not just to protect you from lead, but also to protect you from any um, splatter and so on. Um, and, and I would still recommend radial in these patients. I think for the sake of time, we should move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Arasha Al-Bawardi from Riyadh. We also like to welcome Professor Jean Marco from uh, EuroPCR, who is in the uh, audience. Uh, welcome, Professor uh, Jean Marco. Dr. Arasha, please go ahead with cardiovascular complications of COVID patients. I will Thank move you. your slides. Okay, uh, can you play it from the bottom, please? I uh, will try. Dr. Rupar, um, sorry Shall about the technical. Okay, there we go. Um, sorry about the technical glitch here. Um, so, just to go back to the objectives of this talk, is going to be one, to touch briefly on the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in the COVID-19 patients, but more importantly, to touch more about the cardiac complications that we're seeing from the COVID-19 disease. Next. Um, so the main question that we ask ourselves as cardiologists is, uh, are our patients at higher risk of getting uh, the SARS-CoV um, virus compared to the general population? So there are multiple small studies from China, and there's, uh, after that, they developed a meta-analysis of 15, 27 patients, which showed that the hypertension prevalence in that group was about 17.1%, the cardiovascular disease was about 16.4%, and diabetes was 9.7%. Next. So when they compared that to the general population, next. Next. So they found that the hypertension and diet, uh, can you go back one slide? So the hypertension and diabetes was similar to the general population, but the, they noted that the cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases were actually higher in the COVID-19 patients. However, if you move to the next slide, uh, we can see that with a CDC weekly report from China, next, uh, one more, back actually, back. Uh, from the 44,000 patients uh, who are confirmed COVID-19, they found that the hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease prevalence was actually similar to the general population. Um, next. And this was mirrored also with the US uh, CDC weekly report, which was actually a more larger uh, patient population of about 74,000 confirmed cases. So what we know so far is that they, uh, cardiac patients are at the same risk as the general population to get the virus, but they get it with uh, more severe illness and the higher risk of death. Um, next. So uh, just briefly touching upon, so if, if we need to know what is the mechanism of the virus causing cardiac uh, complications, we just need to also emphasize on what the mechanism of the virus um, to get into the cells. So as we all know, when we've heard this so many times, is that the virus needs an ACE2 receptors to get inside a cell and replicate. Uh, those ACE2 receptors are not only um, present in the pulmonary uh, system, but they're also found in the myocytes. And that could be a potential way of them getting into um, the cardiac myocytes. If you move to the next slide. 
So here are the so the uh, multiple potential mechanisms uh, for the virus to cause cardiac injury. But I just wanted to make it simple and focus on the three main uh, mechanisms that have been talked about in the literature. So one is um, we know that the virus causes an ARDS or an ARDS-like picture. There's been debate about the ARDS picture itself, but that in itself will cause hypoxemia. So hypoxemia can lead to uh, one destabilization of coronary plaques and which causes the regular ACS that we've been seeing, uh, STEMIs and non-STEMI type one, uh, but it could also lead to myocardial injury type two MIs. The other mechanism is that we've seen and we've heard about this type uh, T helper one cell response at a cytokine storm, which causes uh, multiple pro-inflammatory mar markers to go up. And that could also lead to myocardial injury type 2 MI, or it can cause a cardiomyopathy, whether it's stress-induced cardiomyopathy, questionable whether it's also leading to a more susceptibility of myocarditis. The other mechanism that we're hearing about that we probably don't have enough data out there is that there might be a direct ACE2 related heart injury, which can cause myocarditis. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, to focus more on the um, the uh, cardiac complications will break it down into categories. So myocardial injury, which is defined by elevation of troponin. That's the only marker that has been reported there to uh, define the myocardial injury. And those could be divided into the STEMIs and the ACS that we are seeing, uh, as opposed to the non-STEMI type 2 MIs, which are more um, common in this uh, patient population. And this, the percentage of this happening is actually a very um, dramatic, up to 41%. But we have to also realize that though most of these studies uh, look at the sickest population. So the, those asymptomatic with mild illness might not be actually included in most of these trials. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is heart failure. Uh, which could be divided into myocarditis or stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Again, the literature is not very clear, but it's also up to 49% of COVID-19 patients can develop heart failure. Um, one other entity is arrhythmia and few reports of VTVF, uh, up to 6% of the population uh, of COVID-19 patients. Uh, but this is more pre prevalent in the people who actually have myocardial injury. Um, and one questionable thing that we're actually concerned about lately is VTE, venous thromboembolism, and um, one report of possibly a, a PE related to COVID-19. And we can see that there is elevation of D-dimer, but does it really mean that they're more susceptible to having a thromboembolic events? Moving on to the next slide, we'll focus more on the myocardial injury. So these are the trials that looked at troponins, and you can see various numbers of patients um, population, most of them are overall are small, um, but the highest is about four, 16 patients. But the trend goes from 7% up to the 41%. But you can actually see, if you look at the second study and the third one, that the uh, patients who die or patients who go to the ICU have higher, um, uh, higher uh, percentage of having high elevation of troponin, so elevation of um, uh, injury or a sign of myocardial injury. Moving on to the next slide. There's one study that, uh, oh, actually, go back. So um, the question is, who's at risk for cardiac injury? And we, we've been seeing a trend that people who have underlying cardiovascular disease are actually at higher risk. People who are older, men, diabetes, uh, people who have diabetes or COPD. There's one study that looked possibly ACE or RBUs, but that could also actually be a confounding variable for just having hypertension itself. And we know at this point that there's actually no data to suggest stopping ACE or RBUs. Moving on to the next slide. So this is actually a very nice study that looked at um, COVID patients, divided them up into the, those who have low troponins or normal troponins and those who have high troponins. And you can see how mortality actually goes way up the moment you have higher troponin levels. And those troponin levels usually don't rise immediately. They usually rise at least 10 days or 14 days after the initial illness. And they, there is also a trend with it. So they keep going, rising um, after the first set. If you move on to the next slide, the same study actually even divided those groups of patients into those who have no cardiovascular disease to begin with, um, and those who have cardiovascular disease to begin with at baseline. And even those who do not have cardiovascular disease, the moment they have high troponin levels, their mortality can go up to 37% in, in this study. So um, there is actually a trend, and obviously if you have history of cardiovascular disease and high troponin, the mortality can go up to 69%. So not only having an underlying uh, history of cardiovascular disease put you at risk, but also the, if you have elevation of troponin, uh, which actually might be a, a more of a prognostic sign, more than the history um, as a uh, worse prognosis. 
moving on to the next slide. Um, this was mirrored by another also trial that looked at cardiac injury and those who do not have cardiac injury, injury meaning their troponin levels were normal, the mortality was about 4.5%. And those who have cardiac injury, the mortality is actually way higher at 51.2%. Moving on to the next slide. So heart failure is actually not as well defined as cardiac injury. Uh, one study reported that 23% of their patients had, of COVID-19 patients had heart failure, but unfortunately the study did not even mention what was the way of defining heart failure. And we know with the nature of the disease, there's a limit of echocardiography that's available out there uh, just because of uh, the risk of transmitting the disease to the healthcare workers. So there, at the first, I didn't really mention the definition. Subsequent trials looked at the pro-BMP levels, and uh, one of them showed that people who actually die have higher levels of pro-BMP to start with, as opposed to the people who recover. Um, and one study looked at the pro-BMP levels by itself, that it's actually elevated in about 27.5% of the COVID-19 patients. Moving on to the next slide. So the mechanism of heart failure could be divided into, I would say, three categories in this case as well. So myocarditis, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, and in my opinion, I think this is actually more of the myocarditis itself, um, but there's also ischemia-related, if they had ACS, um, that could also lead to heart failure. Moving on to the next slide. So there are a few cases uh, that have been reported out there. Next slide. Uh, so I think most of you have seen this as this one of the first uh, published um, uh, cases about myocarditis. So this was a 37-year-old, came in with shock, inferior ST elevation, really high troponin and BMP levels. He ended up having a CT, coronary CT, that showed no coronary stenosis, um, but showed uh, an echo showed dilated LV with poor LV dysfunction. Uh, this uh, patient was actually treated with pressors and steroids and IVIG, and um, fortunately for this patient, recovered really well, and a week later, had the EF is normal, normalized. Uh, moving on to the next slide, but we don't necessarily see the same uh, next. So this is uh, another case. This was actually actually a myopericarditis a patient, a 53-year-old who actually had symptoms be a week before. Um, next. Uh, a week before, and this time she came in with fatigue, cardiogenic shock, cath showed no obstructive coronary disease, but they ended up not only as the echo showed EF of 40%, but she actually had a cardiac MRI, which did show um, late gadolinium enhancement and myocardial edema, suggestive and acute myopericarditis. So this patient was treated with dobutamine, um, and then uh, after her blood pressure stabilized, was uh, put on heart failure medications. She was also uh, started on hydroxychloroquine, lupinavir, ritonavir, and uh, IV methylprednisolone. Unfortunately, the uh, case didn't really mention the patient actually survived and left the hospital, but they did mention the patient did better. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So this was actually a more recent trial from New York, and this is actually very interesting because this patient did not uh, come in with any pulmonary symptoms. This is a 64 with hypertension, diabetes, who presented with chest pain. It was afebrile, no cough, chest x-ray was clear. So out of all the patients we've seen, we probably think this is a purely cardiac, has nothing to do with COVID, but she tested positive. For some reason, they tested her and she tested positive for SARS-CoV. They had an echo on her and she had an EF of 30%. They took her to the lab and found no obstructive coronary disease, but then sooner, sooner after that, she developed cardiogenic shock, which was confirmed by right heart cath numbers. So in this case, it, the right heart cath really helped them in terms of management. So they put the patient on a balloon pump and dobutamine um, and started hydroxychloroquine. Fortunately for her, she actually also did very well. Balloon pump was weaned and uh, her EF normalized after day 10. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so there's no histology out of all of these. Nobody had a biopsy except this one patient who actually died, unfortunately, and this is a pathological findings. A 50-year-old who had COVID-19 was hypoxic and refused intubation um, and ended up with a cardiac arrest. No cardiac markers that were checked or at least reported in the study. Uh, and the autopsy showed few interstitial mononuclear inflammatory infiltrates, but no substantial damage to the heart. So this also raises the concern that maybe this is actually more of an overactivation of T cells and more of an inflammatory response than a pure myocarditis. Moving on to the next slide. 
So what do we do for, with these patients who develop shock? Um, the recommendations obviously is just conservative at this point for most of them, narepi, vasopressin, trying to avoid dopamine uh, if you can for arrhythmia unless they're bradycardic. For fulminant myocarditis, and this is more um, suggestive of that when you have really high elevated troponins and sometimes the EKG pattern suggestive of a STEMI. Um, so for those, methylprednisolone IVIG could help. The role for mechanical support, we've seen one case where balloon pump really helped. The thing with Impella in these cases I would um, uh, kind of raise is that there is more care with the Impella, so you're suspecting, you're, you're actually um, kind of increasing the risk of the healthcare workers getting the disease from um, in and out, uh, requiring more actually care than the, the uh, balloon pump. The other thing that has been talked about is ECMO, and in these cases could be VV ECMO, not necessarily V ECMO for if it's a respiratory condition only and it's a um, refractory uh, air DS2 event settings, the highest event settings that you have. So there is a report uh, that 14 out of 17 patients who had ECMO um, did not actually make it. So this is a really high mortality. So those patients are really sick. Um, but there is actually a role in selectively in patients who are young, low, um, not much of car, uh, comorbidities. And also for a VV ECMO, we would focus more on the uh, um, if they're refractory to maximum ventilatory support that you can give them. And VA ECMO should be saved for those who have maybe fulminant myocarditis and they're young, not much of a uh, pro-inflammatory condition going on. Moving on to the next slide. So uh, one word on arrhythmia, the only one report uh, did document that VT and BF was um, uh, prevalent in those uh, patients in up to 5.9%. But when they divided uh, that group into those who have a normal troponin, they found that the risk is actually way lower. It's about 1.5%. But those who have elevated troponin had um, a percentage of about 17.3%. There is another report of higher arrhythmia, but really didn't really specify the 16.7%. So those arrhythmias could be both atrial and ventricular. Um, and then we also have to look into the, not maybe necessarily a cardiac injury itself, but it could be metabolic arrangement that they're getting from the whole disease. Moving on to the next slide. Next. So one word um, before I end my presentation, just um, to stay safe out there, uh, use full protective PPE. We know that the healthcare workers are really at high risk of developing the disease um, in one per group that's actually about up to 29%. Um, so in summary, the, we know that um, patients who have cardiac diseases are at the same risk as the general population to get COVID-19. Uh, we know that the virus can um, cause myocardial injury, and it happens usually later in the disease. And the higher the level, the worse the prognosis. And there is some uh, concern of myocarditis and stress-induced cardiomyopathy as well as arrhythmia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. It's a wonderful uh, uh, recap. To save time, we've decided to take the questions to the end. So Dr. Hamid al Ramdi will now present non ST elevation MI. I will stop sharing this video so he can share his desktop. So Dr. Hamid al Ramdi will now present management and guidelines for non ST elevation MI in COVID-19 era. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you, Dr. Waqar, and thank you, Dr. Faiz, for the opportunity and greeting to all the participants uh, who joined us. Just Okay, so um, how can I scroll? I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty scrolling my slides. What if you just click on it? I just oh, need yeah, to- Yeah, there you go, it did, yeah. there you go. So I'll we'll talk about NST, you know, uh, you might see a little bit of an overlap between the talks because basically we're talking about the same uh, issue cardiac uh, complication in COVID era. Um, I would just share with you a touch basically on some of the peculiarities and difficulties when it comes to dealing with those patients and I'll spend more time talking about the management of NST and I've decided basically to limit my talk uh, exploring the Chinese protocol as well as, as, well as the uh, Saudi Arabian Cardiovascular Interventional Society uh, protocol which was published a few weeks uh, max. Now, when we talk about NSTEMI in particular, I think we're talking about two different topics here. The first one is, is uh, the management of proper NSTEMI in COVID time, okay? And, 
and the importance of, of uh, how to deliver good care for those patients, navigate their hospital stay, and try to protect them from acquiring infection within, within the, the high risk um, premises of, of the healthcare facilities. And on the other hand, the other uh, challenge I think is, uh, which we'll, we'll see it, you haven't probably seen it enough here, but I think it's, it's been um, lived elsewhere, is the diagnostic challenge when it comes to making proper diagnosis of anastomy in confirmed cases, especially in those uh, uh, severe cases. In other words, how to make the distinction between acute cardiac injury versus type one MI, that I think personally can be quite uh, challenging. Now, somebody did mention about the, the incidence of ACS in COVID era. Um, definitely, it has been noticed in, in, in China and Europe and in the US that the um, 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 incidence of, of both STEMI and non-STEMI basically is declining. But, you know, talk, you know listening to, to different experts, I think it's uh, fictitiously low. Probably either it's overshadowed, overlooked by the fact that um, the uh, pandemic is, is uh, increasing and also by the fact that patients are very anxious and uh, um, shying away from reporting to hospital for seeking uh, proper uh, care. And that's actually been noticed as well, both in China and Italy, that some of the, uh, those patients presented late uh, with a rather complication post ACS. Uh, Dr. Russia has basically um, given us a very marvelous review regarding the uh, um, CV involvement uh, in those patients. Um, and I'll just to, to make a case, uh, just remind you that troponin elevation is very common in those patients, especially the, the 5 to 10% sick patient. And unfortunately, cardiac patients, um, clearly they do worse than any other patient. Now, out of the Chinese um, 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 review of more than 70 patients, uh, 70,000 patients that came out of the uh, Chinese CDC, when they looked at the predictive mortality, patients with pre-existing history of CVD seem to do uh, uh, worse, um, up to 10%, 10.5% mortality, only exceeded by those patients uh, above the age of uh, 80. Not only that, but even in patients with no prior cardiac history, the mere involvement of the myocardium uh, or the evidence of cardiac in injury based only on the elevation of enzymes, those patients tend to do worse. So the involvement of the heart basically increased the mortality more than 50%. So how do we do uh, with those patients? Now, the general rule basically to, that applies to all patients coming at the hospital, basically, they should be screened very well. And that's in accordance with the mandate of uh, MOH here in the kingdom and in most of uh, other authorities. Um, and, and although we stick to this triaging uh, protocol using the uh, uh, you know, ever-changing checklist, um, we should always keep in mind that up to 80% of COVID patients basically, either they're asymptomatic up to 40% or have minimal, mild, or very non-specific symptoms. So I think personally it's very important to consider all comers these days to hospital as probable COVID positive patients and take all the proportion. And they will take us to the importance of safety measures, which should be basically practiced by all healthcare professionals. And we should minimize risk of nosocomial transmission of those patients through their hospital stay, receiving their cardiac care. All patients should basically um, wear proper PPE. We should minimize the patient's mobility across different uh, units to minimize the risk of, of acquiring the infection. And also we should basically pay attention to their um, to the usual protocol, most of the cardiac patients will stay in emergency basically for initial assessment. Now those patients in these days, I think they should not spend much time in emergency. They should be shifted quickly after proper triaging basically to relatively clean unit within the hospital to complete their assessment. Uh, also, uh, we should have designated cat lab as Dr. Mervet um, said, uh, preferably negative pressure or a unit uh, with HEPA filter. Now, these are the recommendations by the CDC. Now, we'll just focus on the preferred PPE for those patients, uh, which is not different from most of the recommendations. Um, uh, when it comes to the cardiac um, uh, personnel, um, the, uh, the SKY as well as the ACC basic would produce a very nice uh, document. I encourage everyone to read it. Now, the only difference between this one and the one uh, by CDC is the fact that uh, it's a sterile procedure, so uh, as you can see on the left-hand uh, side, you should just add sterile gown as well as sterile gloves, as I said, because of the uh, uh, sterile nature of the cath lab procedure. In short, what are the management of an STEMI patient? 
basically conservative, that should be the default approach, and invasive therapy in very limited situations. And when we talk about conservative therapy, uh, it should be the usual widely known evidence-based ACS protocols uh, that we all know. And I should just mention one thing that the ACE uh, inhibitors and ARs basically, they, they caught quite publicity over the last uh, uh, few weeks, but most of the uh, authorities and societies basically, um, they encourage it's used continuation of its use and it's used whenever indicated because of lack of solid evidence to indicate otherwise. Now moving on to the Chinese uh, uh, protocol which is uh, the first protocol put in place uh, for both STEMI and STEMI patient. It has some actually um, interesting points. Now with any STEMI patient basically uh, who are unstable they basically recommend moving on to the uh, uh, designated cath lab for invasive procedure. Then after that, they strongly recommend um, um, SARS um, COVID, uh, COVID uh, testing. Then disposition after that, it depends basically on the result. On the other hand, if the patient came uh, relatively stable as most of an STEMI patient, they should be triaged and after that should be tested. Then based disposition will be based on the, on the result of the test, but regardless, they should be treated medically except for patients are responsive to conservative treatment, then you should resort to invasive therapy. And also they recommended those patients with high risk to consider PCI, and they did not define what they meant by high risk, but I would assume they would follow the um, agreed upon uh, definition of high risk in STEMI patients. If the patient turn out to be positive, they recommend medical therapy and assessment, reassessment after full recovery. Some of the interesting key principles in the Chinese protocol is the fact that they strongly adhere to maximum protection for all staff. And that's extremely important. That's probably very evident to all of us actually uh, when we saw the, the early days of the uh, pandemic in China. Also, they screen all patients and they utilize fever clinics even before assessing their MI needs, okay? Also for anastomy patients, they tested all comers, all comers. The only exception for those unstable, they would go to cath lab and after that will be tested. So all anastomy patients had COVID-19 test. Moving on to the uh, SASS uh, protocol, which is um, in, in large similar to, uh, to the Chinese to other protocol, the general recommendation that focuses on is the fact that early triage is a must. And once again, that's in accordance with the uh, with the MOH recommendations, um, emphasizing the importance of full PPE, minimizing patient mobility ac across different units to minimize the chance of acquiring infection, and once again, allowing uh, allocating cath lab uh, with negative pressure, preferably or HEPA filter uh, for these high-risk patients. Now, this is the uh, NSTEMI protocol you can see. So for the low-risk COVID uh, patient, we encourage basically uh, the uh, routine approach for medical therapy followed by early uh, invasive therapy and early discharge. However, in, in confirmed cases or high-risk patients, um, we um, SASS protocol uh, advocates medical therapy except on unresponsive patients, basically with refractory angina or arrhythmia. Um, then you can proceed with uh, uh, with PCI followed by medical isolation and uh, the usual therapy. However, on those patients who responded to medical therapy, we should basically continue that and reassess the need for invasive therapy uh, later on after complete recovery. Also, they emphasize a specific recommendation. Uh, one of the important situations that I should pay attention to now that we're adopting basically high risk patient to cath lab. Now, before moving those patients to cath lab, we should basically thoroughly assess and preemptively intubate those patients who, who have uh, ventilatory difficulty uh, uh, before moving to the cath lab to minimize basically emergency uh, intubation in the cath lab with, with its uh, inherent high risk of. Uh, Personalization. All in STEMI patients presented to non cath lab hospitals should be treated medically, and we should avoid transfer except in the narrowest possible situations. Now, just to uh, uh, finish with my talk, I'd like to say that our experience is rapidly uh, growing with, with different presentation, uh, different difficulties, but I hope that 
um, the, the, uh, um, our approach to cardiac presentation will evolve uh, uh, rapidly as well. Um, again, I cannot overemphasize the safety measure. It's paramount in this situation and should be adopted by all staff. And once again, conservative management, evidence base should be the mainstay therapy for non STEMI patients during COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Your mic or what? What part? What yeah, part? Nabil, go ahead. You can ask, ask the questions. Yes, uh, actually, uh, we have a question for Dr. Russia um, uh, regarding the complications that can happen at the level of, uh, I mean, the cardiac complications. Do we have any data about uh, uh, complications that happens after patient recover or once they recover from their illness? Uh, there, there are no reported cases of uh, cardiac complications. Very good question. So I think it depends on how you define recovery. If it's full recovery after 21 days and completely asymptomatic after then, I don't think we have data. The question is that did they label them recovered early? Because we know that the cardiac complications happen later, actually. So one of the myopericarditis was actually a case who had fever and cough and resolved after a week, and then she developed with myopericarditis. So I think it's a question of uh, how soon are you calling the recovery? But if it's 21 days, I don't think there has been anything that's reported after that. With the regard of, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's being a hot topic here, the ACE inhibitor and ARBs, um, and there are so many uh, recommendations now, if the patient is on them, they should continue. There is no, uh, no recommendation to stop them if there is an indication. But would you also initiate them if the patient was not on them, if, if there is a clinical indication? I wouldn't at this point. I think at this point, we, uh, the recommendation is that if someone is on it, you leave it. You wouldn't start it just for the concern of the virus itself. I think the concerns come from the potential concern that ACE inhibitors might actually um, increase levels of ACE2, and there is a potential concern that they might lead to a more um, higher viral load. But there's also might be a protective role that may be a, a less an inflammatory response. Um, so until we have further data, and I, I I'm pretty sure their trials are already enrolling. So once we get the data, I think it's uh, we can recommend to either stop or start. Thank you. Well, there's a few questions uh, for uh, Dr. Hamid, Dr. Russia, Dr. Mirbet about uh, the negative pressure. You you mentioned about uh, preparing readiness your cath lab to negative pressure, and they say many cath lab in Saudi cannot be converted to negative pressure. What if you have uh, COVID positive and you cannot have a negative pressure? Is the HIPAA filter is enough? There's many questions regarding the negative pressure room in the cath lab. Anybody want to tackle this question? Well, I, one thing that I have learned is that, um, you know, as interventional cardiologists, sometimes we're too focused on the STEMI or too focused on one thing. Uh, and we don't take the patient for the package. Um, if we've treated this patient with a thrombolytic therapy and we look at the COVID, we need to address the COVID in this patient as well. If this patient is going to have a mortality, there's a higher chance that the mortality is going to come from the COVID than it's going to come from the STEMI that we have treated, perhaps not in, by PCI and taking him to a cath lab, but uh, uh, treated him with lytic or her with lytic therapy. So I, if, I, if we do not have a negative lab, I would not take a STEMI patient, and I would focus on treating the COVID. Good. Dr. Arasha, there's a few questions about, uh, you know, the percentage of the false positive PMB and troponin in the false COVID positive, uh, or also... If, sorry, repeat that question again. The false positive test of troponin and PMB in the... So, very good question. So, if you look at the studies, they actually vary in terms of what testing they're using. And we know the troponin itself, also, there are multiple um, assays out there. 
and the multiple uh, ranges of normal depending on the hospital. So fewer ones in, in, uh, in China actually reported exactly what the level is, but some of them actually did not really say exactly what the levels and what assay they're using. So there's definitely a, a potential concern that there might be not, not much of a consistency between those studies and the exact level of CoBNP. But there has been a trend. I think what we should focus on, there's a trend that higher troponin and higher mortality, uh, there is a, a higher trend for higher ProBNP in some of those patients. Patients, sicker patients too. Okay. The, last, the last comment I will make about it, Dr. Mirbet for the STEMI patient to avoid extra testing like the echo is to do, you might replace the LV assessment by LV angiogram, doing an LV angiogram at the cath lab to see, the, to have an idea about the LV and to see if there is any complication. And instead of exposing the echo people or to, as you mentioned, to do a focus echo assessment for that. I have a question for uh, Dr. Mervet and Dr. Hamid. So uh, in those patients uh, who responded to lytic therapy, so uh, they, uh, they improved, or those with non-STEMI who responded to medical therapy and they stabilized, uh, do you have a time frame for those patients to be taken to the cath lab for further risk stratification? You know, I think based on the uh, SASS recommendation, we um, sort of agree that we wait until actually full recovery from COVID because that would take, should take precedence over basically um, their benefit from an early intervention. Um, um, and that's the same actually with the Chinese. Um, they, they propose basically full recovery first before tackling um, the residual disease. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Uh, let me just turn this on. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. No. You are muted. Okay. No. Now you can hear me. We have a question from Dr. Jean Marco. Could you comment on the antithrombotic treatment in the young COVID patients presenting with uh, elevated troponin? Do you fully anticoagulate them and they still thrombose? A very good question. Unfortunately, no data out there, but I hear his concern. I think there's actually maybe a potential benefit for these people. Uh, but we have to also be careful that maybe they, if they get into a DIC picture, that maybe they're more prone to bleeding. Um, but younger patients, we've actually heard of one case possibly of a PE and a confirmed um, um, COVID-19. So there might be actually potential with those high D-dimers that might be a high risk of VTE. Uh, are we at a stage where we can suggest it to everyone with a high D-dimer? Probably not, um, but hopefully we'll have more information in the future. Do we have any more questions? In the question from Dr. Faisal Govi about uh, how are we going to deal with the surgical indication, notably in the pandemic, if the pandemic stay longer? Well, um, I know our surgeons are uh, reluctant to open the cardiac OR, and uh, actually, it's it's interesting when you speak to them. You know, we we talk about protective equipment, um, but what they require to perform their surgeries, you know, the glass, the extra uh, focus um, glasses, and so on, are are actually not very easy to wear in surgery with the protective equipment. Um, the other thing is 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 obviously the intensive care stay. So as I mentioned in my presentation, you do want to conserve as many intensive care beds and facilities as possible. And what we have noticed during the COVID era is we are actually doing more higher risk interventions, but we have a very honest discussion with the patients uh, and we do not do it ad hoc. I mean, the patient remains on table conscious, obviously. We talk to them, we talk to the family and uh, with the surgeons because we don't want the patient back and forth, but uh, we, we have ended up doing uh, more left main PCIs and so on, um, obviating the need for surgery and explaining very well to the patient why we're making this recommendation during this pandemic, and otherwise we would have recommended bypass surgery. 
Uh, another good question, I think, does uh, successful fibrolytic therapy mean in the era of COVID-19 mean no cath? I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows, to be honest. And I think most people, why, why what we're saying is give thrombolytic therapy and re-stratify your patient. Um, so re-stratify if the patient is negative or if the test comes back negative, we immediately take the patient to the cath lab. If they are positive, we do not. We are very reluctant to the pa take the patient and we're more conservative. What's going to come out of that, we actually don't know. This is the first time uh, the whole world has encountered something like this. Um, so we're yet to see what happens and what comes out of these patients. But perhaps for the time being, acutely, this seems to be the safest for the team and for the patient. Are there any more questions? Uh, there is many questions about the ACE, I think, and uh, Dr. Han and Dr. Rashadi elaborated on. I think. They did. Okay, if there are no more questions, then I can close the webinar, uh, thanking again Saudi Heart for this opportunity. And the message, the take home message, I will give it to everybody that uh, we have had three excellent talks uh, on a subject that is very new to us, all of us. We, last year, there was no such thing as a, uh, essentially a, um, a viral pandemic that's going on and we are facing it. Uh, the recommendations that are there, either from SASS or ACC or the Chinese recommendation, they're all very fluid. They are changing. They're changing every week, every two weeks. So the best message you're going to take out from here is uh, stay up to date. Keep reading it. Keep reading. Stay up to date as the recommendations change. And to stay safe. Uh, the message you got from all our, these are not cardiologists in Saudi Arabia. They're telling you, uh, don't jump to the cath lab, um, including myself. I would rather cath anything that moves on the Earth or planet Mars. And we are saying don't cath these patients. Don't take, to, take them to the cath lab. So stay safe, keep up to date, and that's uh, our take-home message. And I would like to thank the speakers for all their time and the panelists and Saudi Hart and Dr. Faiz Bukhari for the opportunity. Thank you very much, everybody.